This is Lisa Schwartz at Berkeley Lab. Welcome to the webinar for the fifth report in the Future Electric Utility Regulation Series. Today, the authors of our new report on recovery of utility fixed costs will each spend about 15 minutes summarizing their perspectives on the topic and then take questions from the audience. First, I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about the series and go over webinar logistics. The series is designed to inform ongoing discussions and decisions by utility regulators, policy makers, and the electric industry. We use a unique point-counterpoint format to present different viewpoints on the future of utility regulation and business models and the trade-offs in achieving a reliable, affordable, and flexible power system. The U.S. Department of Energy funds the series. Five reports are completed so far, with a sixth report out for review. DOE is providing support for additional reports over the next several years. An advisory group of state regulators, utilities, and stakeholders help prioritize what topics we cover and provide guidance on how we cover them. Before I turn over the mic for today's presentation, here are a few housekeeping items. First, we're recording the webinar and we'll post it on our website. And second, because of the large number of participants, everyone except for presenters is in listen mode only. So please use the chat box to send us your comments and questions. You can enter your questions at any time and we'll answer as many as we can following the author's presentation. For today's webinar in particular, please direct your questions to a specific author if it's applicable. Again, the report authors will each have about 15 minutes to present. I'll then moderate about a half hour of Q&A with the authors. The report and the webinar slides are posted at the website shown. And following the webinar today, we'll be posting a recording. Our presenters today are Lisa Wood, Vice President of the Edison Foundation and Executive Director of the Institute for Electric Innovation. Ross Hemphill, an independent consultant with a 35-year career focusing on rate-making theory and practice. Most recently, he was Vice President of Regulatory Policy and Strategy for Commonwealth Edison. John Howitt, a Senior Energy Analyst at the National Consumer Law Center. Previously, he served as a Research Director at the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities and Director of the Association of Massachusetts Local Energy Officials. Ralph Cavana, Co-Director of Natural Resources Defense Council's Energy Program. He's also been a visiting professor of law at Stanford, University of California, Berkeley, and a lecturer at Harvard Law School. And Severin Bornstein, Professor of Business Administration and Public Policy at University of California, Berkeley's Haas School of Business, and a research associate of the Energy Institute at Haas. Our presenters today represent utility, consumer, environmentalists, and economist views. And perhaps not surprisingly, there wasn't a consensus on the preferred way to address recovery of utility fixed costs. Following their presentations, we'll respond to questions you post in the chat box. If you wish, you can direct your question to a specific author of the report. And please enter your questions at any time. We'll be tracking them throughout, and then I'll be moderating questions and responses at the end of the presentation. So let's begin our presentations with Lisa Wood and Ross Hentel. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on what, um, <laughs> where you are in the country. This is Lisa Wood. Um, I'll be talking for a few minutes um, at the start of, the, of our uh, slides here, and then I'll be handing it over to Ross. So uh, we're, we're going to be talking about providing a regulatory path for the transformation of the electric utility industry. Next slide, please. And basically, the industry is undergoing three major trends today. And I think many of us on the call today would agree that we are witnessing a major transition of the power sector. And one of the issues in transforming a regulated industry is, is how do you change, change the regulations associated with that. So I'm going to just focus quickly here on three areas 
um, of this transition. One is the transition to cleaner energy. And we have two stats here. And the, the point here is that between the end of 2014 and the end of 2015, we reduced carbon, carbon emissions were 15% below 2005 levels. Now they are 20%. So we're seeing a lot of renewables come into the grid and a lot of um, tr transition from, from coal to gas. Second thing is a more digital and distributed power grid. So one is we are investing a lot of dollars in digitizing the power industry in the U.S. The second major issue here is this trend, exponential growth in distributed energy resources. This is probably the most fundamental and important point about why we're having this discussion today about pricing. As distributed resources grow, it's very important that distributed resources and the power grid are priced appropriately. And you'll be hearing from all of us on that um, throughout the discussion today. The third area here, and this is, I would say, is just beginning to unfold, is the use of data. Um, people talk about big data and how is that data really being used to generate value, not just value with how customers use their energy, but also value in terms of managing this more hybrid grid that we're moving towards. I would say that's pretty much in the infancy stage at this point. And the last area, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of key trends is what I call individualization or customization of customer services. And <clears throat> I'll give a few examples of that as, as I go through some of the slides today. So next slide, please. So the first thing is just a quick chart in terms of our transition to a cleaner energy, a cleaner energy generation mix. And you can just see very clearly in 10 years, the U.S. has made a major change. Um, and the big, the big thing here is a, a huge reduction in coal from 50% to about 34%. Gas is basically taking up most of that. Nuclear is fairly constant, and we're also seeing growth in renewables. Now, even though the numbers for renewables are small, we're seeing exponential growth in renewables in the U.S., and we expect that to continue over the next several years. Next slide, please. Second trend, and I think this is a trend that is really driving a lot of our conversation today, um, we are developing more and more distributed energy resources our, dig our grid is becoming much more digital and our grid is becoming more complex and much more of a hybrid grid where we have a mix of central power generating sources and distributed energy resources. Now, we still have largely centrally generated power in the U.S., but we are moving fast to acquiring a lot more distributed energy resources of all types. So I just want to be clear on that. Energy efficiency is a distributed resource, demand response, storage, rooftop solar, and other things. These are all distributed energy resources, both demand side and supply side. So a couple of quick points here. Um, we've deployed about 65 million smart meters to date in the U.S. Um, that started about five or six years ago. That's about one half of all U.S. households, and we keep track of this every single year, and we expect this trend to continue um, in terms of smart meter deployments. These are important as sort of the, the, the little box that talks between the customer and, um, and the utility. Second is our investment in the grid is about $20 billion annually on the distribution side. Our capex for the industry is much larger than that, but the grid this um, investment is, is fairly significant, and that's driven by two things, the growth in distributed resources and, the, and being able to integrate and enable those resources, which takes investment, and also operating the grid in a much, in a much different way. So those are, are two pieces of the investment to really enable kind of two-way power flows and inf information flows. So next slide. The third trend I just want to touch on for a minute here, I do think this is a fundamental change. It's a newer trend, but this individualization of customer services I think will fundamentally change how we think about rate classes in the power sector. If we think historically about the electric utility industry, a lot of times we talk about residential customers, commercial customers, industrials, or small CNI versus large CNI. But they're big rate classes. But what we're seeing today is customers asking for very customized services. And I think the digitization of the grid, the, um, the um, deployment of smart meters, and other things really allows for this, allows for this customization to occur. 
But this customization also means flexibility, allowing for flexibility and offering different kinds of services to different kinds of customers. So a couple, one thing I want to point out, which I think is a huge, huge trend, is we're seeing large corporations um, across the U.S., major, major companies. This is, I'm talking about Amazon and Google and big companies that are asking for 100% renewable energy to meet their energy, to meet their own, you know, corporate sustainability goals. This is not just RECs, as we've seen in the past, but it is energy and RECs. And the question for the utility industry is, can we provide this service? Do I have a tariff in place to offer this kind of customized service? And we're seeing it happen in Nevada. We've seen it with NV Energy um, and a, a large data center switch. We've seen it happen in, um, with, with uh, Duke and Google. We're seeing it happen with Dominion. Lots and lots of places where these basically one-off customized tariffs are being put in place, but more, we're seeing them happen more and more. So I think flexible offerings are the future. And um, I think it's really, really important to be able to offer to the customers what they want. Second area, of course, is the solar option. And these are happening in all different ways. We're seeing customers ask for rooftop solar. We're seeing um, customers opt into subscription or community solar options and also large-scale uh, utility solar, which is now about 60% of all the solar in the U.S. So state policy issue, a huge issue here, and the whole net metering debate, you know, what, what, how do we price these services and who can offer which types of, sol of solar services to customers. Then last thing just quickly is we are starting to see new business offerings. And I would just characterize these as as-a-service businesses where primarily these companies are coming into and offering very large customers an energy as a service um, service. And what that means is I will help you manage your energy. I will help you figure out you know, what you want to buy, what you want to produce on site, do you want storage, what kind of rate should you have, what kind of efficiency should you be investing in. It's not the same as what we've seen in the past, I think, with, with Honeywell and Johnson Controls. These are fully integrated offerings, and we're just seeing these pop up today. But again, it goes towards the trend that we're seeing of customers want very tailored services. Next slide, please. So the big question is, <laughs> are the regulations and the policies in place that will facilitate or block changes in the power sector? So a lot of things have to happen for the power sector to move forward. The utilities have to move, technology has to move, regulation has to move, policy has to move. So um, how is the business model changing? So as the grid becomes increasingly digital and distributed, are we pricing the power grid right? Are we pricing distributed energy resources right? We'll talk about some, some thoughts we have about that today. Um, and then also as customers de demand more individualization of services, you know, how must regulation change to allow flexibility, or how should regulation change, or should regulation change? You know, should we be offering customized services? Next slide, please. Okay, okay I'll so, pick it up here. Uh, this is Ross okay. and Bill. You know, we have a, a mass amount of, of information to cover and a very small amount of, of uh, time. Um, what we are talking about here are the alternative approaches that can lead to the appropriate recovery of, of the utilities fixed costs. But one thing we need to emphasize is there's not a one size fits all. Ultimately, the agreed upon approach, approach needs to depend on the utility, the state, all the other policymakers in the state, all the other stakeholders. In the paper that we are talking about here, there are a couple approaches that we recommend pursuing, starting with the concept of using a, a more frequent rate case approach. And what we're proposing is something like what is being done in Illinois uh, with the formula rate making process. Then we'll also talk about uh, two other cost-based rate approaches, uh, full recovery of fixed charges and demand charges. Each of these approached Approaches, if implemented properly, will lead to the appropriate level of the utilities fixed costs. And after discussing the cost-based pricing approaches, we'll cover a couple of approaches 
that we view as less desirable given today's challenges in the industry, including decoupling, LRIM, and the minimum bill. Next slide. Formula rate making is an approach to setting the appropriate level of revenue recovery on an annual or sometimes other time basis in a streamlined regulatory process. This provides the utility with more stability regarding cost recovery as opposed to the periodic rate cases and results in larger customer benefits with regular needed investments in the utilities infrastructure. It was put into effect. It's, it's been tried and in, in, in applied before in other areas, um, Alabama and other areas, I think in the southeast, but it was codified into law in Illinois as a result of that state's Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act, uh, referred to as EMA, which was passed in late 2011. The process was streamlined. And what do we mean by streamlined? It removed, but basically it, it took the traditional rate case process and allowed it to happen within, usually within eight months. And it did that by removing the rate design from the annual process. So rate design was only talked about every three years. Um, the ROE, the, the return on equity, which is usually a major part of any kind of traditional rate case, became a simple calculation of two parts. It was the 30-year treasury bond rate plus 580 basis points. Um, Boom, you know what happens. Uh, there, I don't think there's even a, a separate testimony anymore. I think it's a couple of lines um, in an existing testimony uh, to cover that. And there were a number of things that people looked at that, that had been litigated time after time over the years um, and decided by the commission and decided that it was best to just codify it into Illinois law um, in terms of what the uh, result would be with regard to those issues. Uh, next slide. Since fifth year, this is the only process, and it's become pretty simple and methodical. Um, the utilities are required to make their filings each year by May 1st. They set those rates, that filing sets those rates uh, for January 1st of the filing calendar year. The cost information is what, it, what is filed by the FERC Form 1. Um, in terms of setting the uh, revenue requirement and also for reconciling for what the previous revenue requirement was because it was, in fact, really an estimate. The Commission has 240 days to make a decision after full litigation. Um, and by full litigation, all the other, you know, the, the steps that one would take in a traditional case are followed. Um, it's just an expedited process. The next slide. Um, the results in Illinois are really good. Um, the annual formula rate making process provides pretty much it, it, it has shown to provide the stability that's needed for the utility to make the investments that it needs to make to improve service for the customers at the same time. It holds the utility accountable um, for delivering benefits. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that there are metrics, uh, performance metrics that are included, and they share off uh, basis points if they don't meet those metrics. Um, the results are the customer reliability is a historical high level. Um, storm response is really good. Um, the resiliency when there are uh, storms has improved remarkably. And the thing that I find most remarkable is the fact that customer satisfaction has improved. Um, as a result of this, um, even even though you have one of the things I was concerned with when I was back at, at ComEd was you're going to have annual rate cases. Basically, that's the way the press is going to look at it. And um, and even though there has been something before the commission every year, the customer satisfaction has improved. Next slide. Other recommended cost-based approaches um, are. The, and this is probably not new to anyone that's been looking at this for some time, but the increase in the fixed charges, uh, basically look at reflecting in the fixed variable charges what the actual fixed variable costs are. Um, 
I think it's pretty well documented. The current fixed charges are below, far below, what the fixed costs are incurred by the utilities. Um, but this is, and I have been a, a witness involved in this uh, when I was uh, at, at ComEd, and, and there's a lot of evidence around the country. It gets stiff opposition uh, for a number of reasons. We don't have time now to go through all of them, but I think uh, probably other presenters will will, uh, will go through that. Um, and so uh, another approach has been looked at increasingly in the future, or, or uh, currently, and that is um, another cost-based approach would be demand-based pricing, uh, where you just replace the kilowatt hour charge uh, with a, a KW charge. Uh, there's a number of advantages to this. It would reward the higher load factor customers, and um, there's you know incentives there for customers to to inc improve their load factor. Um, you know, respond with the demand response uh, and respond to the other uh, price signals. But there are other challenges with this. Um, um, it's, I think, uh, something that has a lot of good prospects in the future, but there's a lot of education that has to happen with customers, but that doesn't mean we, go, we don't go forward with it. Um, we just have to work with customers. And the next slide, there's a couple of things that we don't recommend in terms of the future. Um, decoupling is one. Um, it had, I think, some really good potential when really the only thing that we were dealing with was, was energy efficiency. But what we're dealing with in the industry right now is the growth of DER. And with the growth of DER, um, what we find with revenue decoupling, especially if, if the, the, the transfer of, of what is not being recovered uh, from fixed cost goes back into a volumetric charge, it exacerbates um, the price signal and, uh, and causes, um, I think, more of a transfer um, that, that goes on or, you know, cost shifting that goes on from the participants to the non-participants. Um, the minimum bill is something that, that has been introduced and it has been thought about, you know, for, for many years. Um, here the price signal remains exactly the same. Um, which has benefits from the uh, energy efficiency side of it, um, but the problem is that the customer is really not seeing what the what the true cost is, and so there's there's not transparency there. Um, if you go to slide 21, uh, I'll turn it back to Lisa. Okay, I'll just wrap up very quickly because I think we're a little bit over our time here. Just a couple of final thoughts. Um, I think today we do recognize that electric utility companies are providing both grid services and energy services, yet there's a tremendous amount of tension around charging for grid services directly. And this is, this is the whole cost shift issue underlying net energy metering. We talked about some options, again, for, for recovering utility fixed costs today, and, and, and our other um, authors will talk about additional options. And why is this important now? It is important, as I said at the very beginning, because as the number of distributed energy resources continues to grow, and we expect it to grow exponentially, the power grid is increasingly as important as the integrator and enabler of these resources. So we think it's absolutely critical to price grid services right and, and adopt transparency and do it sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Okay, John. Thanks very much. Uh, especially to you, Lisa, for the invitation to participate in this project. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, National Consumer Law Center is a uh, nonprofit law and policy advocacy group based in Boston and Washington, D.C. We're concerned about economic and racial justice in the U.S., marketplace justice, uh, and uh, work on energy, utility, and a broad range of um, economic and, and financial issues. Um, uh, thank you also, Lisa, for initiating this uh, particular component of, of the broader DOE project that you're working on. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, this point-counterpoint approach and laying uh, disparate views with respect to rate design out in, in um, a single document may 
uh, help inspire dialogue between uh, the broad range of stakeholders that participate, usually at the state level, in proceedings uh, in a way that uh, initiates discussion before uh, physicians are, are are locked in through filed uh, testimony and, and, and at other points in litigation. So I think there's real value to this, and, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, useful dialogue uh, continues and follows from this project. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you, Kristen, for doing this. Uh, but uh, it's not news, and, and Lisa Wood just uh, laid out some of the dynamics here, but the utility industry is um, certainly in rapid transition right now with uh, nearly daily changes to uh, generation and end-use technology uh, and economics, uh, although ac access to those technologies and the economics of those technologies uh, are certainly not uh, evenly distributed uh, and uh, would like to talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but it, uh, as Lisa mentioned, advanced communication technology, digital communications have um, fundamentally altered uh, metering, billing, grid operation, and other aspects of uh, the energy and utility industries. Uh, we have seen relative to uh, the past 50 or 75 years, uh, in a relative sense, uh, flat or declining electricity and natural gas sales, uh, although uh, this pattern is, is also uh, varying at, in different regions of the country and throughout different utility service territories. Uh, and that's an important dynamic, is, uh, that variance as uh, we look at uh, some of the rate design challenges that uh, uh, are in, on the table here uh, today. Regulatory assumptions and utility business model assumptions are in flux. Uh, as uh, most on this call know, there are uh, in increasing numbers of states proceedings ongoing to, uh, to look at the fundamentals of uh, the regulatory model. Uh, but uh, a growing number uh, in each of these states, I think uh, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, the outcomes uh, of these proceedings uh, are, are really uh, are, are not set right now, and nor the ramifications of these, um, you know, of, of this uh, of this process. And um, my hope is that uh, issues of equity. Uh, and uh, consumer protection remain front and center in each of these discussions, um, whether they pertain directly to rate design or uh, investment in uh, new technology or, or expansion of existing technology. Uh, the questions of equity really uh, not get cast uh, into the afterthought category, but uh, remain front and center. Um, slide, please. Uh, but as the old saying goes, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And really, one constant that um, you know that uh, that really uh, is, is unlikely to be fundamentally altered as technology and economics changes is that home energy service really remains a basic necessity of life. And you know, these, these are not new concepts, but absent. Uh, ready access and affordable access to heating, cooling, lighting, refrigeration, increasingly communications, uh, and home energy services required to retain these, uh, to retain these uh, end use benefits. Uh, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that um, those benefits today and the costs associated with home energy service are regressively distributed. So. Um, that regressivity, as evidenced by uh, variable energy burdens in the residential sector uh, and, and other measures, really are, are important to bear in mind. Um, in, in addition, access to uh, energy efficiency and management ge and generation technologies is certainly not an equal uh, opportunity proposition as we go forward here. And in this transitional uh, period, I think it's important to bear that in mind as well before we 
hastily adopt uh, rate designs and rate structures that may um, disproportionately burden those who don't have access to some of this technology. Slide, please. Uh, quickly, I'd like to <clears throat> lay out some of my own biases and assumptions that uh, inform the rate design uh, uh, recommendations to follow. Uh, but really, uh, the idea from uh, NCLC's perspective is to ensure uninterrupted access to affordable home energy service, a pretty basic um, uh, objective, I think. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, in my view, it's necessary to retain uh, effective regulatory oversight over utility procurement and pricing that has direct bearing on customers' rates and bills, uh, but also the terms of service, billing, customer service, and credit and collection operations that really uh, are the sort of the foundation of the consumer protection structure that um, has evolved in uh, just about all of the states across the country. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but in order to ensure uh, such access, um, we think uh, it's really vital to um, preserve the economic uh, and operational viability of a utility distribution system that retains the obligation to serve all customers. And in many of the utility of the future, in quotes, discussions that I, I've participated in over the years, this assumption really doesn't, doesn't hold. And uh, for some consumer advocates, the loss of that, uh, of, of that uh, entity with an obligation to serve, uh, in light of the fact that um, technologies on um, energy management and um, generation are not going to be equally distributed, uh, the loss of that dynamic uh, and that framework is, is very troubling, that prospect. Um, energy efficiency, from my perspective, remains the, uh, the premium energy resource, and that informs some of the discussion to follow as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with respect to some of the, um, the individual rate design options on the table here in today's discussion, I'd like to start with uh, the uh, fixed customer charge um, option here. But uh, we've seen this as perhaps the predominant utility response over the, in the past couple of years to uh, changes in um, both the end use world and, and uh, broader uh, technology and economic uh, worlds that are in play here. Um, you see, in at least 34 states, there have been proposals to shift recovery of the revenue requirement from the variable uh, uh, price, or the, excuse me, the variable component of the bill uh, to the fixed uh, monthly portion of the bill. Uh, and it's an arithmetic uh, fact that uh, this, um, uh, this approach shifts costs from the uh, high volume consumers within a rate class to those low volume consumers within a, in the rate class. And the data clearly demonstrates, the EIA data, that um, uh, on average low income, elder, and uh, households of color uh, use less electricity uh, on average, again, than, uh, than their counterparts. And this is contrary to uh, the arguments that have been put forward in a number of the utility filings over the past few years. Um, but we also believe that um, this approach diminishes the energy efficiency uh, incentive and customers control over their bill, um, which is uh, a, a negative development. And finally, I would suggest here that uh, fixed costs should not be equated with fixed charges. Uh, in many other businesses, uh, just about all other businesses around the country or uh, in, in an economy like ours, fixed costs, uh, many of them are uh, recovered through variable charges. Uh, next charge, please. Uh, excuse me, next slide, please. Um, this. Uh, quickly is a, uh, an, an example of the extent to which 
um, increasing the fixed charge and uh, shifting cost recovery cost recovery from volumetric to uh, fixed charges uh, has an effect on uh, different uh, customers with varying consumption levels or usage levels. This is from Madison Gas and Electric a couple of years ago where uh, the proposal was to go from 1044 to $19 a month on the fixed charge and um, concomitant um, reduction of the volumetric charge. And we see that a customer at uh, 450 kilowatt hours a month sees a 5.5% increase. Um, a customer at 900 kilowatt hours a month sees a reduction in the bill. A high usage customer at 1400 kWh a month sees an even greater reduction. So there's the cost shift. Uh, it, it creates problems. And uh, if I can go through the next slides fairly quickly. Uh, the following slide shows um, in New England, in uh, one region which consists of Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont, that among different income categories, uh, usage is, is uh, lower at the um, lower income levels. Same is true for Massachusetts. In the next slide, you see this dynamic carrying through among households uh, at 150 percent of poverty or below. Uh, on the next slide, we see that uh, for elders, uh, folks at 65 years of age uh, or greater, usage on average is less than their younger counterparts. The following slide uh, shows the extent to which among African American headed households, usage is considerably less than uh, their Caucasian counterparts. Uh, the next slide shows that uh, this New England example is not just an anomaly, uh, but that uh, there's amazing consistency across the country uh, in this dynamic. Uh, so please take time uh, later to take a closer look. I know it's hard to see this slide right now. Um, it's important to note here that nationally consumer energy efficiency and renewable energy advocates have uh, forms an alliance to defend against proposals to increase uh, fixed charges on all customers. Uh, and this group, I should say, effectively works together uh, collaboratively at the state level uh, on this and a broad range of other issues. And uh, it, it's an exciting development here. Um, revenue decoupling, very quickly, is um, uh, is the next uh, approach that I took a look at very quickly. Uh, consumer advocates have had concerns about uh, loss of ability to litigate a cost structure, utility risk mitigation with no commensurate benefits, increased pricing volatility, um, and, uh, and often this, this comes as a, um, a mechanism to promote energy efficiency, uh, but without a um, uh, a, a link to actual increase in utility energy efficiency investment. Other consumer advocates have uh, noted customer confusion, you know, the, the, the idea that the less I use, the more I pay. Um, well, uh, on the next slide, uh, and then I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to um, uh, end here, but um, I think there are a number of uh, there are a number of approaches and, and design elements that can be employed that uh, make revenue decoupling uh, one of the approaches that uh, can help stabilize the utility's revenues uh, without and, and break the utility uh, throughput incentive uh, in a way that uh, might be more palatable to some consumer advocates. But I would stress here and before going through these, it really is important to implement these and, and to incorporate them during the design phase of a proposal. Um, this, this can't just be uh, window dressing in policy discussions, but we have to see real proposals come forward with elements like this. Uh, but the, the, the main one, perhaps, is that regulatory review of utility cost structures has got to continue. Uh, you, can't, you can't just turn this into autopilot uh, going forward, uh, and particularly in cases when uh, 
undepreciated value of the utility capital investments uh, come into a play on a regular basis. That cost structure has got to be trued up on a regular basis. Um, we've got to find ways to uh, cap upward price adjustments that may result um, in, in some circumstances from revenue decoupling and limit cost adjustments between rate cases. Um, there have to be commitments regarding targeted energy efficiency investments so that decoupling really is uh, tied to uh, increased energy efficiency benefits for consumers. Um, and uh, ideally, revenue decoupling, in my view, needs to be uh, combined with uh, an inclining block rate structure so that any surcharges in decoupling are tied to the tail block um, of the uh, inclining block structure and credits to the uh, initial block. Now, uh, I'm out of time, and um, unfortunately, uh, uh, I'm going to have to turn this over, but uh, the full report does contain considerable commentary on time varying rates, prepaid service, advanced metering infrastructure, and other rate design options. So uh, sorry to go over a little bit, and thank you very much for your interest. Thanks, John, for sticking uh, to your time. Appreciate it. Uh, now let's turn to Ralph Cavana. Uh, thank you, Lisa. And in scrolling down the list of names in this audience, uh, I see a wonderful cross-section of experts, some of whom I've known for decades. It's a privilege to address this audience. Uh, I begin with an observation that although you are going to be hearing five quite different perspectives, and we are going to sound like we're in violent disagreement on some things, if you locked the five of us in a room in any utility proceeding in the country and gave us an opportunity to come to a common recommendation, I'm predicting that we could do it. And the basis for that prediction is rooted in part, and I hope this comes across for those of you who get a chance to read my paper, in a sense that it, it's always a mistake to look for a single approach and find it at a panacea. They're going to, any rate design solution is going to need multiple elements. Uh, and well, the, the, the package, there is a package that can work for a broad range of perspectives uh, and a broad range of interests. Because I think we are getting an increasingly strong and shared agreement that the system does need to change in light of some overriding realities that Lisa Wood laid out at the very outset of her remarks. And that there is a lot of common ground in terms of what, where we need to go and what the critical criteria are in getting a good outcome. For me, an important beginning insight, and here I'll ask for the first of my two slides, uh, because I want to show you two pictures that uh, illustrate what for me are, 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 are critical elements of the solution. The fundamental shift in the trend in electricity use nationwide, which really became visible in the year 2000 and is even more visible since, is where I begin the conversation. That is, before the year 2000, electricity use consistently grew at rates well above the rates of population growth. Uh, and since 2000, uh, the uh, rate of electricity use, uh, growth in electricity use has actually dipped well below population growth. What was once reliably and universally understood as a comfortable commodity business, uh, where re increased recovery of costs could be linked to the reliable annual increases in use, that, that era is over. And the whole vocabulary of commodity use, rate payer, thinking about utilities as reasonably having their financial health tied to increases in kilowatt hour sales, I'm hoping for most stakeholders is behind us now. It then becomes important to think about how we might change. And there are very different perspectives on how that should be done. Uh, but I believe that uh, the, 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 the critical questions to ask in thinking about how to, res how to move us out of the commodity model uh, into a model that allows utilities to be fully engaged and motivated participants in a clean energy transition, there really are three critical questions that my paper tries to address. The first is, given declining growth in commodity sales, how do utilities secure the reasonable revenue certainty that's required to make enduring provision for clean, reliable, and affordable service? without reducing customers' incentives to use electricity efficiently or to generate it themselves in ways that provide economic and environmental benefits. 
So there's that first question of how can we do this? How can we break from the commodity model without reducing rewards for things we want customers to do? A second question, and Ross Hempel put this powerfully, and I acknowledge it, is how can regulators allocate the costs of enhanced electricity grids equitably among all who use them? And finally, how can rate designs best signal to customers the actual costs of the electricity services they use to encourage efficient choices? something I know my friend Severin Bernstein will be talking about. In all three categories, when we think about rate-making approaches, the recommendation in my paper is that we begin from a fundamental point. Uh, and, and here I want to respond to an objection that Ross raised. Ross said, the problem with revenue decoupling is it doesn't solve the problem of ensuring that every customer makes a reasonable contribution to the grid they're using. And I'm going to agree with him. But I'm going to point out that we can't expect each of these approaches to solve all problems. We need to think of them in combination. And the reason revenue decoupling is fundamental to me before we get to rate design uh, is that it does break us out of the commodity model. It removes the link between financial health and sales. It's an approach that's been tested in half the states. The reasonable objections that my, uh, and concerns that my friend John Howitt raises can be addressed, and he and I have been testified together uh, in proceedings in which they have been addressed. And the important thing that revenue decoupling also does, by assuring that fluctuations in sales don't eliminate or affect your ability to recover your authorized costs, is it opens a path for more experimentation in rate design, because it reduces the risk of significant under or over recovery uh, as we move to systems that are designed to address the challenges that Lisa addressed at the outset. If you do not have revenue decoupling, innovation and rate design becomes significantly riskier for everyone involved. If you do have it, you've got an assurance that, regulated, that uh, authorized costs will be recovered uh, independent of fluctuations in sales. You can do that in conjunction with consumer protection. You can address the throughput addiction question. And then you can turn to the issue of how to make sure that price signals are efficient and that every customer who is using the grid uh, makes an appropriate contribution to it. Now, in moving to the rate design approaches, the three recommendations that I made, the areas where I think we have the most potential for consensus are, again, I think of them as a package. The first, and if you can move to the next slide, is time varying rates. And the interesting thing about this slide, in, in, the, in the debate over whether time-varying rates will shift costs, will change incentives, a, an important empirical question for those of us, for example, who are enthusiasts about energy efficiency and want to be sure that people are rewarded uh, for making their businesses and homes more efficient, uh, is to ask the question, on average, is a robust portfolio of cost-effective efficiency measures going to save more on peak than on average or less on peak than on average. And I commend all of your attention, although it wasn't devised specifically for this purpose, the findings of the Northwest Power Planning Council in its seventh regional plan, which was issued just in the last few months. The council every five years updates its aggressive and diverse portfolio of cost-effective efficiency measures. And this year, the council took a careful empirical look at the likely impact of the portfolios of efficiency measures, both the low cost ones and the higher cost ones, on both average use, summer peak use, and winter peak use. And what you can see from the graph is that for both the higher cost measures and the lower cost measures, the on-peak savings are larger than the average savings, which means that a move to time varying rates would likely reward those who were aggressive in adopting energy efficiency uh, even more than a conventional system of flat volumetric rates, uh, although I will say parenthetically that I share my friend John Howitt's enthusiasm also for tiered rates. But the point of this slide is to provide some interesting evidence that I hadn't seen before on the likely impact of time varying rates on overall incentives to adopt cost-effective energy efficiency. In, in, addition, uh, in, terms of, uh, in addition to time varying rates is a, an approach we regard as promising. Uh, and the Regulatory Assistance Project has written extensively on this and has also talked about ways of aligning time varying rates with critical peak pricing, uh, surcharges when the system is under severe stress, and some elements of tiered rates uh, that uh, address very uh, departures from average consumption and provide rewards for uh, saving for those who are using the most and continue to follow the policy. Uh, the, the, uh, 
the principle of the more you use, the more you pay. The integration of time varying rates with inverted rates looks promising to us, as does the minimum bill. And in turning to the minimum bill and distinguishing it sharply from the fixed charges that John Howitt has addressed at length in his paper, I think it's important to underscore, first of all, there's a lot of confusion out there in the world about what's the difference between a fixed charge and a minimum bill. Uh, someone once explained it to me uh, as, as, say, as, as the distinction between a cover charge and a two drink minimum in a bar, and that is uh, somewhat helpful. But in addition, for me, what the, minim the way to explain the minimum bill, and Ross Hempel's word, how do I explain this to customers? I think you explain it to customers by saying, we're going to continue to charge you for electricity based on how much you use, but everyone who is on the grid is going to make a minimum contribution to it. And I think that that is intu seems intuitively fair to folks. It has the appealing feature, of course, that as long as the minimum bill is set at a relatively modest fraction of average consumption, say 20%, say 20 bucks a month, relatively few customers are actually going to be seeing a bill that is the minimum bill. Most customers are going to use more than that. They're going to continue to pay, how much, pay based on how much they use. But if they've got a big distributed generation system or if they've got a vacation home, they're going to make a minimum contribution to the maintenance of the grid. If you do it that way, you avoid many of the equity concerns that John, I think, has persuasively raised. And you get at Ross's concern that, hey, I want everybody who's connected to the system to make a minimum contribution to its upkeep and maintenance. Uh, and that strikes me not as, a, not as a panacea, not as a total solution, but as part of a solution to an effort to get equitable distribution of grid costs. And the combination of a minimum bill with revenue decoupling should give Ross some reassurance that revenue decoupling isn't simply going to re redistribute costs uh, away from people who are using little or no electricity, maybe because they've got a second home, maybe because they've got a big di a distributed generation system. In addition to laying out those combinations, time varying rates, uh, minimum bills, uh, tiered rates, in conjunction with revenue decoupling. Uh, what my paper does is to talk about what from our perspective are likely to be less effective reforms, and in some cases reforms that will clearly and are already gathering significant opposition. Uh, I'll touch briefly on those. Uh, in terms of frequent rate cases, uh, the reason that we're not particularly enamored of them, in addition to the, co the regulatory costs of doing it, uh, is that they don't solve the problem that revenue decoupling is trying to solve, which is making, utility, making sure that utilities' financial health isn't tied to fluctuations in electricity use. Rate regulation, how, no matter how often you have the rate cases, you never make utilities whole for losses since the previous rate case. The best you can do is readjust assumptions in an attempt to avoid losses in the future or windfall gains. And once the rates are reset, any subsequent reduction in commodity costs costs utilities an increment of fixed cost recovery with no hope of recouping it. No matter how often rate case decisions occur, as my friend Rich Cowart used to say, most of life is lived between them. Uh, and without revenue decoupling, utilities' throughput addiction will continue undiminished. On higher customer fixed charges, uh, John Howitt I, has, has laid out a case with which I am in generally full accord of course, take into an ex extreme high fixed charge. You could have the entire bill be a fixed charge, and this has been tried in some places. Uh, we, it, Reliant has such a plan in Texas. Uh, it's, it's designed, quote, to give ultimate bill security to customers, but of course it was instantly and properly dubbed the all-you-can-eat plan. And by moving significant parts of the revenue stream into fixed charges, our concern about that approach to rate design is that for all customers, it will significantly reduce rewards for saving energy. Uh, and we don't think that a persuasive case has been made that we need to do that. Much of the rationale for efficiency programs and standards rests in part on the conclusion that extensive market failures continue to block energy savings that are much cheaper than additional energy production at today's electricity prices. So the last thing we need, in our view, is rate designs that encourage additional electricity waste. And finally, on lost revenue adjustment mechanisms, they sound benign. Regulators will calculate lost revenue from efficiency and maybe from distributed generation and restore them through rate increases. But our view, and my paper goes into the empirical experience at length, uh, is that there are all kinds of perverse incentives that emerge from such programs. They obviously 
re promote programs and reward programs that look good on paper but deliver little or no services in practice because then the company gets a double recovery. Uh, and they're an automatic annual rate increase, which makes them uh, understandably unpopular among many consumer advocates, whereas revenue decoupling adjusts rates up or down depending upon whether sales fluctuations push authorized costs above or below the authorized level. And that for us is a more promising way of solving the problem that lost revenue adjustment mechanisms are, are aimed at. Uh, so in summary, what I've tried to do, and it's the most important thing for me to say about this, is that there are in every state, I'm, I'm predicting, going to be ways of coupling multiple approaches to solving the problems that Lisa laid out at the outset. There's tremendous goodwill and willingness to do that. Uh, we don't have to rely on adversarial pitched battles. If we can get more collaboration up front, more engagement among interests like those represented on this call, I think we'll make rapid progress together. And I'm now happy to turn everything over to Severin Bornstein to correct my many inadvertent errors. Thanks, Ralph. Severin? Thank you. Um, and uh, I am going to actually agree with Ralph right off the bat that I think it is going to take a combination of approaches to uh, to solve this problem. Next slide. I want to step back by uh, focusing on what the problem is and why there is a cost recovery problem. And part of that is economic, that prices should reflect the actual cost somebody imposes on the system. And that is not just the private cost of supplying electricity, but also the externalities, the local pollutants and the greenhouse gases that consumption causes. But that's not the only reason we're worried about cost recovery. There are also issues of equity, um, not just income distribution issues of equity, but people's sense of fairness. For instance, that large consumers uh, pay, may pay less towards recovering grid costs or may pay, may pay no more towards recovering grid costs than small consumers. And many people think that's unfair. And of course, with widening income inequality, there's a concern about low-income consumers. All of this has gotten a lot more difficult because uh, tariff policy can no longer just focus on equity and distribution. And 20, 30 years ago, regulators had a much easier time because their job was basically to decide whose ox got gored. Most people didn't have much choice. And as we're seeing more choice, both in terms of uh, uh, distributed resources and energy efficiency, uh, an ability to leave the system partially or in some cases even wholly, um, the regulators have to think about response, not just uh, how to allocate costs. And of course, all of this is getting more difficult as volumetric sales decline, um, making existing tariffs less sustainable. Next slide, please. I want to remind uh, listeners why we care about efficient pricing, the why setting price to equal that full social marginal cost is so important, and that because setting price higher or lower encourages inefficient behavior. There are some people argue that it's always good for people to consume less electricity, but that's clearly not the case. Uh, if somebody is thinking about getting an electric vehicle, uh, you want to send price signals that accurately reflect the cost of charging that vehicle. If the true social marginal cost of electricity is 10 cents, and the utility charges 20 cents, that's essentially doubling the gasoline equivalent cost of charging your car from about 158 a gallon equivalent to 315 a gallon. And that's going to discourage people from using electricity to charge to, for transportation. It also discourages many valuable uses of electricity, such as outdoor lighting that improves safety. Pricing below social marginal costs encourages overuse. Setting Price below encourage, gives insufficient uh, incentives for energy efficiency and encourages people to use electricity when they're not getting much value out of it. So we really need to focus on getting those prices right. Next slide, please. I do want to point out that what I'm saying includes societal costs, that is, all of those externalities. They need to be priced in. in. Everywhere that includes greenhouse gases, and in some parts of the country, an even bigger uh, impact is local pollutants, including sulfur. Uh, and it also means that we focus on marginal costs, in particular short-run marginal costs that is time-bearing. Uh, there are times when your consumption imposes large costs on the system, and pri the price you face should be higher. That doesn't mean that everybody has to be on time-bearing pricing, and giving people an option 
to remain on a static price should be there, but it, those people have to face up to the fact that they are imposing higher costs on the system, and the, the flat rate should reflect that. Next slide, please. It is important also to recognize that setting price equal to marginal cost doesn't mean that you can't recover at least some additional revenue towards fixed costs. And this is just an illustration that the fact is that when you get towards peak, marginal cost goes up, the price should go up, and that helps recover uh, additional revenue that can be used to offset some fixed costs. Next slide, please. Another way in which this occurs is right now utilities pay little or nothing towards their dam towards the externalities, but even if they aren't don't have to pay for greenhouse gas emissions, they should still be including those in prices, and that allows them to cover additional revenue or collect additional revenue as well that can be used to offset fixed costs. So the price should reflect full social marginal cost, and if that brings in extra revenue that helps cover fixed costs, that's just an extra bonus. Next slide, please. For most utilities, however, efficient pricing is still going to lead a, leave a revenue shortfall. This is partially because the distribution costs and some uh, transmission costs are largely fixed, and because utility revenues cover many other costs besides uh, just uh, the cost of providing energy, low income programs, subsidies for distributed generation and energy efficiency, and in some cases, uh, expensive contracts that have been signed in the past that utilities are still trying to cover. Um, and also because uh, reducing quantity, as we are doing, means that the social marginal cost goes down uh, because we're not stressing the system as much so that we're not having to use the expensive marginal generators. So that's going to lower uh, the social marginal cost and leave a revenue shortfall. Plus, as that quantities do decline, they're simply selling less revenue, selling le uh, less electricity. Uh, and when that happens, that's going to, again, exacerbate the revenue shortfall. So we are going to have a revenue shortfall, even if we set prices efficiently. Next slide, please. So what are the options for recovering revenue? Well, the oldest option, of course, is average cost pricing, simply raising the volumetric charge. Um, and that's what we have done for years and years. Uh, in many places, we've also used tiered pricing and fixed charges. And I will talk about those. Uh, people have suggested minimum bills. And here's where Ralph and I will disagree uh, strongly, though not violently, and demand charges. And I will also argue that those are not a good solution. Finally, I will argue that frequent rate cases are a fine, are, are, are reasonable policy. They obviously have to balance the cost, the re regulatory cost, but they're not solving the fundamental problem here. Next slide, please. So fixed charges are very attractive on efficiency grounds because they, there's almost no one who's going to actually drop off the system because of fixed charges. There are some exceptions. Um, before Jim Lazar starts typing away, I will say that, uh, but they are very rare. Uh, the real issue is one of equity and the view that you, a fixed charge applied to all customers means that my home pays the same fixed charge as Google's campus. And that just doesn't make sense to people. Um, one could make a distinction based on usage, but then it's not really a fixed charge because people will respond to the fact that going over some threshold will uh, raise their fixed charge, and so it is essentially ma marginal. Uh, there's also concern about low-income consumers. There is this repeated claim that fixed costs should be recovered through fixed charges, and there's just no basis in economics for that. Uh, as one of the earlier speakers pointed out, there are lots of companies that have large fixed costs, and they do not recover them through fixed charges. Uh, the fact is that the goal here is to set prices for volume, marginal prices that really reflect marginal costs, and then see what's left over and figure out how to raise, how to, how to um, raise that revenue. I would disagree that a utility, 50% of a utility's costs are fixed. If you correctly uh, consider fi the, uh, what's fixed, but even if that were the case, that's not a reason that fixed costs, should, that fixed charges should cover half of all costs. Next slide, please. Tiered pricing is uh, another option, particularly increasing block pricing that is used in large parts of the country, though decreasing block is also uh, commonly used. Um, they do, on average, 
lower the cost for low-income customers, but as I, the research I've done shows, that is a very poorly targeted way of helping low-income customers. And it, there's some important equity issues. Almost nowhere do they make any adjustment other than some lar large regional adjustments. So they don't adjust for the number of occupants in the house. Um, and they end up setting prices in many parts of the country that deviate grossly from social marginal costs. In California, uh, some marginal prices are well over 30 cents a kilowatt hour, and it would be hard to argue that the social marginal cost is even half of that. Decreasing block pricing, uh, where the price decline, marginal price declines as you charge less, as you consume more, uh, the, uh, is used. And that is sort of a midpoint between a fixed charge and flat volumetric pricing. Essentially what it's doing is it's taking that fixed charge and instead of putting it on the very first kilowatt hour, it's spreading it out over the earlier kilowatt hours. Some people view that as more equitable than a fixed charge, and I think you could make that argument. Um, but you still have the problem that uh, some kilowatt hours are being charged at a price that is very different from social marginal cost. Next slide. Minimum bills are never a good option in my opinion. Um, the minimum bill is identical, this is just math, to a fixed charge plus free electricity. And the slide here and an example in my paper shows the, just walks through the math of that. But essentially what it says is you're paying in this example an $8 fixed charge, and then because you have a minimum bill, if the marginal price is 10 cents per kilowatt hour, then the next 80 kilowatt hours are free. Uh, as someone said earlier, it's important not to undermine price signals. This grossly undermines price signals. Um, this is rate design that encourages waste. Uh, anyone who's at the low end of this uh, is now getting free electricity and has no reason to conserve. Now you might argue, well, almost everyone's going to be above 80 kilowatt hours, and if that's the case, then it won't encourage waste. It actually just won't do anything at all. It won't raise revenue. It won't help to solve the revenue shortfall problem. It'll just be a non, uh, it'll be a complete fig leaf arguing that we're doing something when we're really not. Next slide, please. Certainly one efficient alternative is to never let price go below the social marginal cost, which in this example, if it were six cents, at least charge that for the first 80 kilowatt hours and have a lower fixed charge. Next slide, please. The old demand charges were based on your highest non-coincident peak usage, um, no matter when that occurred and no matter what, what was going on at the grid at the time. Um, the, there was at one point an argument for this sort of charging when, uh, when, the, when the customer was, uh, had a, uh, to the extent a customer has a connection uh, that has its own cost that actually varies with the size of their service level. Now, there's, even then, there's a good argument for just charging directly for the service level so that Google's campus needs a much higher service level than my home, and they would pay a much higher regular fixed charge based on service level. Demand, the term demand charge is now being morphed into something that charges for the customer's peak usage during certain periods. And in doing so, it's moving towards a form of dynamic pricing. But I would say it's a much more confusing form of dynamic pricing. Customers have to keep track of what their peak usage is instead of just con trying to conserve on days when they get some signal from the utility, this is a really stressed time. So it's a less efficient form of dynamic pricing than using critical peak or real-time pricing. And I think it's actually probably less appealing to consumers since it's much more complicated to try to keep track of one's own peak usage. Furthermore, it still isn't hitting dynamic, the peaks right. It may be saying we're going to charge you for your peak use during the peak demand period, but the day you consume your most may not correspond to the hottest day or the day the system is most stressed. So I think demand charges, like minimum bills, really don't have a place in solving this problem. Next slide, please. As I said earlier, I think frequent rate cases or decoupling, uh, there are arguments one can make for the, these things. They clearly have potential uh, problems and costs associated with them. 
but I think they're just not solving the fundamental or addressing the fundamental problem that we want to start from charging prices that reflect the true cost someone is imposing on the system when they consume that one more kilowatt hour and recognize that there's a shortfall and try to solve try to make up that shortfall in the least distortionary and most equitable way we can. And I don't think frequent rate cases or decoupling just address that problem at all. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I think there's no perfect answer to meeting the revenue shortfall problem um, from when we charge efficient prices. Some answers are a lot better than others. Fixed charges almost certainly should play a role. Uh, I think to some extent that should be based on service levels. Uh, marginal prices should have to meet a real social marginal cost uh, test. That means simply arguing that charging high prices or uh, to some customers will get them to conserve uh, should not be a valid argument for uh, those prices. The c conservation should only be encouraged to the extent it is efficient conservation, where there really are, there are, it is a use that is not high enough value to justify the social marginal cost. And finally, I think some old tariff designs, particularly demand charges and minimum bills, may be something people are comfortable with, uh, but uh, they really don't meet uh, a test of being cost-based um, or, I think, being uh, uh, efficient uh, for customers or equitable. Thank you very much. Thanks, Severin, and, and thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll go through as many questions as we can until 11.30 Pacific. Uh, let's start with one for Ross Hemphill. Um, the question is that many co-ops have had sort of formula rates for years that implement an annual adjustment to recover or rebate distribution costs that aren't recovered in volumetric energy prices. Is this what you mean by formula rate plans? Um, and so how does this actually differ from revenue decoupling? And I'll ask everyone to try to really uh, provide your answers in as short a time as possible. Ross, can you uh, comment on that, please? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yes, I think that's an excellent question. Um, one of the things that's in the paper that uh, Lisa and I wrote is that the, the process of the formula rate is kind of a, a it turns into a, it's very much like a uh, budgeting process. So you go through the process of seeing what is expected, comparing that to what happened with regard to the cost, and then you put a forecast out there. And then the next year, do the same thing. All right, what was expected compared to what happened? And you you do a reconciliation. So it's a lot like what happens, you know, in the uh, cooperatives or, you know, sometimes municipalities with regard to that. And in terms of the uh, decoupling, it all has to do with how you deal with the rubber, the um, building determinants. So in the case of Illinois, there's a little bit of a disconnect to the way the law was written. And so I think there's like a two-year lag. People on the line could correct me if I'm wrong, but but I think there's like a two-year lag. But nonetheless, you're, you're updating the building determinants and so you get somewhat of the decoupling um, effect with that. All right, thanks, Ross. Let's move on. Um, this is a question for Lisa Wood. Lisa, how do you suggest that utilities price customized energy services to customers? Does the answer vary by customer class or size? And if utilities provide these energy services, how do you ensure other customers don't cross-subsidize them? Um, hi, yeah, <clears throat> great question because that is the fundamental issue. I'll just give you the examples of some that I know about and they are related to renewable energy services, these um, basically green tariffs 
where the customers, these are large corporate buyers, were asking for 100% renewables. And in those cases, um, one, of the, one of the reasons they actually got approval for the tariffs was because um, those customers paid the actual costs. They were not um, being subsidized by other customers. And I think that is really important, that whole point, that if people want customized services, in this case, they basically bought into um, you know, a piece of a solar farm or something like that. Um, they get, these contracts were, were put into place, or these services, customized services, were put into place in different ways. But one of the key issues for getting the regulatory approval was that the customers were not subsidized by other customers. So excellent question. Great, thanks, Lisa. Um, this is a question for Severin. Um, you've used the term societal marginal cost, but you use that term uh, describing rates based on short-run marginal cost rather than long-run marginal cost. And uh, the commenter says that most economists in rate proceedings for decades have advocated rate design based on long-run marginal cost and that every state has adopted marginal cost as the basis for interclass cost allocation. Um, using the long-run cost. So can you comment on that, please? Yeah, the textbooks are real clear on this, that short-run marginal cost sends the right price signal. And certainly, we want to send a different price signal to consumers at the peak, uh, peak stress on the system than during the middle of the night. And that requires pricing according to short-run marginal cost. However, there is a concern that we have to recover the the base the cost of capital for base load and peaking capacity how do we do that well part of that is going to come through time varying pricing not through just averaging those costs over all the kilowatt hours which is less efficient but through putting more of those costs on the peak times of the day or the times when the system is most stressed so that you will recover some of those revenues still through time varying pricing However, I will be honest with you, it probably won't recover all the costs, and that is the fundamental tension we face right now. And I think saying, well, we're just going to price going to long-run marginal costs is pretending that isn't a problem. It's ignoring that tension when, in fact, we should be pricing in a time-varying way, which means higher prices, which will help recover a lot of fixed costs and uh, during uh, peak times. But then we have to recognize Raising rates at other times is distorting prices, uh, and, not, and just averaging long-run marginal costs over all the kilowatt hours is not necessarily the right solution. All right, there's a question for John. Uh, the concern is that you know, as more customers become generating customers, that that might tend to shift costs toward um, customers who can't afford rooftop solar if rates remain the way they are. And so um, what are your recommendations for addressing that going forward in a, in a future that we may have more uh, rooftop solar? Right. Well, um, I certainly appreciate the assumption behind that question that there is, uh, at least currently and, and perhaps going forward, unequal access to uh, some of the new generating technologies and the financing necessary to, to Make it work, and so forth, and, and uh, that um, you know that dynamic certainly is present right now. But with respect to um, recommendations as to um, how to deal with uh, increased penetration of uh, distributed solar uh, and other distributed resources um, among some customers, but but not all and how to protect lower income customers uh, in that case, there, there really are uh, a couple of pieces to it, uh, in my view. One is, uh, the, and it's the positive approach, but we really need to, um, to think big in terms of coming up with ways to increasing access to those technologies, and, but, but more importantly, the benefits of those technologies, the economic benefits of those technologies, to uh, households that might not have the upfront capital or other, uh, or own a roof uh, and, and uh, meet some of the other criteria that are required to participate. Uh, and also increasing energy efficiency in those households is, is part of the solution in my view. But at the same time, um, and uh, you know, I, and this is where I may part company from some of my uh, friends in the uh, 
is in the rooftop solar uh, advocacy field. Uh, but I really think we need to have um, pricing uh, for um, for those who use the grid as a, a backup battery. Uh, that that pricing has to be reevaluated, and it must be fair. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, on the you know the other side of that is that the price for paid to uh, generators for um, uh, the kilowatt hours that they produce and put out onto the grid, uh, they need to be set in ways that truly um, reflect not only the benefits that, uh, that come uh, from that generation, but also the costs uh, that, that go on to uh, the distribution system as a result. So it, it's sort of a multi-pronged approach. Thanks, John. This is a question for Ralph, and actually there are two related questions. One is relates to the uh, one of the slides you showed um, really pointed out that a, a key change should be flattening of electricity consumption. Um, so how does significant market penetration of electric vehicles in the future change your recommended approach to these issues? And related, what rate strategies might be most effective to extend, for example, you know, um, Midday EV charging. Um, I don't know why we want to attempt that, but if if you want you know, a good, right time sure. EV charge or demand response to address curtailment. Gotcha. It, to be clear, the point of the graph is not so much an imperative to flatten consumption as to demonstrate that cost-effective and diverse portfolios of energy efficiency are at least for the Pacific Northwest saving more on peak than off peak on average which means that if you move to time varying rates as Severin, for example, is suggesting, you are likely to get larger rewards for saving energy than if you stay with flat rates. And I think that's an interesting finding. On the issue of uh, electric vehicles, uh, here again, I think Severin and I would be in violent agreement. Uh, what you want to be doing is sending the people who deploy them strong price signals to charge when the system is most receptive. Uh, that is, you, you certainly do not want people charging the vehicles during peak periods. You want to use aggressive pricing to move that charging to off-peak. And of course, there are uti the utilities that are now seeing a lot of electric vehicle uh, penetration are, are moving to do that. With, in, in the case of, for example, San Diego Gas and Electric, some really dramatic and positive results for those of you who haven't seen them. So I am quite optimistic that vehicle electrification will end up being a grid enhancement uh, rather than a grid strain. But Getting pricing right is important uh, as part of the strategy for doing that. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm not, uh, I, I think what we're, we're going to see a grid that where increasingly what we need is flexibility in both our loads and our generating resources. And we're going to want to create, we're going to want to create more rewards for delivering that flexibility into the system. Thanks, uh, Ralph. Here's a question for Ross. Um, the question is, you know, uh, there's a bond break principle that's at least embedded here, rates should reflect costs. And is there any economic literature or research to support the somewhat different assertion that um, this uh, audience member heard that rate design should mimic cost structure? Ross, we can't hear you. Sorry, I'm mute. Understand the uh, question. Ross, we, we can't hear you. No, can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you repeat it? Uh, the question is, um, ha is there any literature in the economic uh, journals or research to support um, what this audience member heard was the assertion that rate design should mimic a utility's cost structure? Well, there's a lot of research in economics that the price should reflect what the cost is. Um, and that's, you know, you can go forever looking at that. The, you know, there's a, also a ton of research or discussion with regard to how do you do that in utility pricing or utility rate design. 
and that's been going on. I mean, I I started the uh, my my uh, career started like 37 years ago, and you're looking at just what are the costs? What's the you know the what's going on in terms of the uh, of the uh, of of the cost with regard you know with regard to uh, um, variable and, and and fixed and all that and it's been going on forever with regard to how to best reflect that in the rate design and. It's been difficult. All right, thanks, Ralph. Let's move on. Um, Severin, uh, there are a couple of related questions here with respect to increasing levels of wind and solar on the system. Um, it, you know, one of the questions is, you know, do time bearing rates really make sense, you know, given, given the increasing dominance of these, you know, zero marginal cost resources on the grid in terms of matching cost causation? And do you see any major changes in rate design, you know, any other additional potential changes in rate design as a result of these uh, resources on the system? Well, I think time-varying rates make more sense than ever. Uh, in California, we're now seeing the famous duck curve, which is showing that net load is actually very low. It's getting lower and lower on spring and fall midday. Uh, and so we're now seeing very low costs of providing electricity in the middle of the day. If you don't send price signals uh, to consumers saying now is a good time to charge your car or to, do, to run your wash or whatever, then what we're going to end up doing is having to curtail some of the grid scale uh, zero cost resources. And we, we can't curtail the rooftop because the inverters on them do not give the grid operator the opportunity for the most part, certainly nothing before the last couple of years. So I think sending price signals to consumers is going to become more important than ever and recognizing the time-bearing availability uh, of power. Um, that is going to create, I think, a bigger cost recovery problem, particularly in the short to medium run, as we have subsidized and pushed more zero-cost resources onto the grid. The, a lot of grids in the United States are oversupplied and it's pushing prices below long-run uh, costs of generation. And so a lot of generators are unable to recover their costs. We're seeing this, of course, with nuclear power plants, but we're also seeing it with gas plants that we're going to continue to need. And so I think this is going to recover or create a bigger cost gap than we've had in the past, and we're going to have to figure out what's the most efficient way to cover that cost gap. And, uh, you know, John Howitt wanted to get in, in here and uh, address quickly time-bearing rates. John? Yeah, real quickly. Uh, I think um, it's important to bear in mind as, uh, as we increasingly discuss time-bearing rates across the country. Well, first of all, uh, as Lisa pointed out, only uh, about half the residents in this, uh, in this country have AMI uh, smart meters installed at this point. And uh, the rate of implementation and rollout is really slowed in, in the post our era. So um, where, where it doesn't exist, the costs of AMI and also some of the con consumer protection ramifications of remote disconnection uh, really have to, I, I, in my view, be part of that discussion. But in terms of the time varying rates themselves, uh, it, it's also important to bear in mind that um, there really are variants uh, in, in these models, and which ones are adopted matter a lot to consumers. Um, you know, time of use rates uh, that um, vary predictably over um, the time of, uh, uh, during a particular day or, or season uh, are far more predictable, and perhaps uh, folks are more, you know, might find more adaptable than critical peak pricing or real-time pricing that um, is less predictable and perhaps far less uh, difficult to um, for for some consumers without energy management equipment uh, to respond to. So um, 
So anyway, uh, I think uh, it's important that to, to keep in mind as we go forward that we can do time varying rates in ways that um, allocate the costs of AMI uh, in a way that shifts risks to um, proponents or, or utilities as opposed to consumers when the business case is made, uh, but also that, um, you know, that, uh, that this, uh, these models not be made mandatory or these pricing um, structures not be made mandatory initially um, and that uh, hold harmless uh, and shadow billing uh, design features be employed particularly as new pricing is rolled out uh, and, um, and also consumer protections around uh, prepaid service and keeping prepaid service out of low income households for reasons that go beyond the scope of, of this uh, particular discussion are borne in mind. All right, let's move on. Uh, it is time, but if, uh, if folks uh, want to stay on and can stay on, that's great for a few more minutes. When I get, we have a lot of other questions. Severin, um, this is a particularly tough one, I think, um, but maybe not for you. How, how really should we consider sunk costs? especially if they're, um, you know, quite different uh, from current value. Yeah, I, I think that that is at the heart of this revenue shortfall problem. The utilities that have large sunk costs due to bad investments of the past or things that they did try um, uh, have an additional revenue requirement. And I think we need to recognize there is no good way to cover that. Um, anything we do is going to cause some inequity and uh, some problems. Uh, the, if they were prudently uh, incurred costs, then the regulatory authority is unlikely to say that shareholders have to cover them. Uh, putting them into fixed charges is one way to do it, but there are going to be real equity problems. And I think fundamentally we then face this trade-off that uh, we need to recognize putting more into fixed charges won't distort the economic incentives as much, but will raise real equity issues. Putting more into volumetric pricing uh, will be more fair but uh, because large users will pay a larger share, but uh, it uh, distorts the economic incentives. Uh, Ross, if you could answer quickly, um, do you have recommendations on the balance between recovery uh, of, of fixed costs versus demanded charges um, compared to recovery of those fixed costs to customer charges. Could you ask me again? Uh, what do you recommend on the balance between recovery of fixed costs two ways, through demand charges or through fixed customer charges? It's tough to answer that because the you're trying to recover the same level of cost. So it's one is on an average basis through a fixed charge. The other is through trying to measure what the demand is on the system. So that's that's a problem. All right, so, uh, we have a quick question about recovering fixed costs in, in say, a vacation community where you've got, you know, very high percentage of seasonal customers. So how do you equitably recover fixed costs in, in that kind of community? Uh, let's start with Severin. Uh, I think then that, that is an argument for fixed charges. The fact is that, or for a service level charge. Um, or for a minimum bill. Or, or for a uh, minimum bill if we really want to do it the wrong way because that's going to set up an incentive for that person who is, who is not in their vacation home to leave a light on because why not? They're going to get charged for it anyway. So uh, Ralph and I will continue to disagree on this, but the math is clear that a, fixed char or a minimum bill gives way free electricity. It's just a fixed charge plus free electricity, nothing more. So Isn't there a volumetric that, charge along with the uh, initial fixed minimum part? Not if there's a minimum bill, because once you've paid the, once you're, you've, you're connected, you're going to have to pay that minimum bill whether or not you consume the electricity. So effectively, 
the marginal cost of consuming one more unit of electricity is zero. Uh, it's just like going, it's just like a two drink minimum. Once you sit down, those two drinks are free because you're going to get charged for them whether or not you consume them, so you might as well drink them. And that's what we see. Here's and so a minimum bill ahead, is sorry. just a fixed charge and free electricity. This would have been much more fun in person. Um, I, let's ask uh, maybe one or two more questions for any uh, of those uh, who can stay. Uh, and I think this is a question for Lisa, um, perhaps, or Ross. What are some of the reasons why formula rate making was not codified in jurisdictions um, other than Illinois, or not many of them? And um, you know, what have what have been the arguments against formula rate making, um, and are there solutions there? Okay, I'm going to say a few words about this, and I'll turn it to Ross. But basically, formula rate making, I I think, is working very well in Illinois. It has worked well in other places. It's just I I just feel. I don't know the exact reason why, whether it's because it takes a lot of work to get it in place. Um, Iowa has had a formula performance-based rate making in place for a very long time. I'm not sure what the status is exactly today. Um, I don't know the answer in terms of why it is not in place in, in more in more jurisdictions. Ross, can you address that? Yeah, I, I think I can. Formula rate making works a lot better if you have the separation between um, distribution um, and other forms of delivery and the generation, which happens in Illinois. And there's a number a number of other uh, of, uh, of jurisdictions where that is taking place. So I think it's worked well in Illinois because it's just that area, you know, distribution in particular. Um, I wanted to see if John has any comments on formula rate making and what he's heard, but, but also whether um, Ross mentioned some performance metrics when he was presenting. And I'm wondering whether performance metrics as part of formula rates could address some consumer concerns um, that John you raised regarding the lack of being able to litigate the utilities cost structure. Uh, do you, did you want Ross to go first on that? No, no, no. I'm asking for your response, John, to some of the some of what you heard on formula rates and and whether performance metrics might solve some of the issues or not. And, and you know, if you're aware of um, reasons why uh, formula rates may have not been adopted as as widely as um, as utilities have proposed them. Well, I, you know, I, I think um, I think some of the uh, some of the concerns with respect to uh, that have been raised uh, with respect to revenue decoupling and the ability to uh, to litigate um, for stakeholders to get in and, and litigate the cost structure um, from time to time or on a regular basis may apply here. Uh, but um, I, I think what, what you're suggesting in terms of, of what the actual performance standards are and, and how they're measured, uh, you know, this is this is one of the devil in the details uh, questions. And, and uh, in, in looking at formula rates, uh, I found it challenging for that reason, uh, given that it's such an open-ended construct to to give a um, you know a, a definitive thumbs up or thumbs down, it really depends on what the evaluative criteria are and how they're measured and and uh, you know how often you get to come back and and uh, take another look. So I'm sorry to give you a vague answer there, Lisa, but um, that's what you're going to get here. It depends. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Wait, wait. Late. Can Ross? Can Ross just reply? Ross, can you just say something about the? the I, I think you mentioned it earlier about some of the um, how the performance results in Illinois. Yeah, it's it's worked so well for five years in Illinois. So what you have is it's an infrastructure question. You know, this is just what is required to create the type of platform that's needed to accomplish what you need in Illinois 
and you lay it out over five years and it rolls. Each five years, you update it. And then you figure out just what it costs to do that. And it's like a budgeting process. And this is so important in the future because so much is relied upon that platform to be able to move forward with the type of stuff we're talking about. So each year you move through and you have a process that looks at what it takes to finance that. And if there are, you know, areas that are, the, you know, negotiable and such, you work them out and each year you decide in a very close negotiated process what the result is. All right. I think we're going to have to cut it off there. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. We do have our next report, the sixth report in the series, The Future of Electricity Resource uh, Planning, coming out uh, probably next month, August. And then the Department of Energy um, has agreed to find additional reports, uh, three reports this year and hopefully in the, the coming years as well. Thanks again. And remember, everything is posted, including a recording of this webinar and the slides at the website you see on your screen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lisa.